Before we get to the fundamental theorem of finite cyclic groups, I'd like to start with a preliminary theorem, one that is also very useful to us computationally and that we will use in order to prove the fundamental theorem of finite cyclic groups. Uh, I will not be providing a proof of this theorem here. Um, that can be found in Galleon or in lots of sort of standard resources for an abstract algebra class. In the interest of time, I'd like to cut out the proof of this. Uh, but here's the statement of the theorem. Let's take a little group element G in some sort of larger group. Let's assume that the order of G is N, which means that the group generated by G, by little g, has N things in it. Now, what this theorem is going to help us do is it's going to help us take any old positive integer K and figure out how many things belong to the group generated by G to the K. That is, you have this group element G, you know precisely how many things are in the group generated by G, but maybe you'd like to know something about a power of G, something that lives inside the cyclic group G, uh, and you'd like to know how big is the group generated by that element. Um, and this theorem is what's going to help us do that. So, the first thing that this theorem says, is it says the group generated by G raised to the k power is the same as the group generated by G raised to uh, the power of the greatest common divisor of N and K. So the first part of the statement of this theorem alone is helpful for picking out different generators of the group generated by g to the k. Theoretically, it helps us pick out a smaller power that would generate the same group, which is helpful computationally. What's really great, however, about this theorem is that it goes on and it says I can tell you more. I can tell you more than just that this the group generated by g to the k would have been generated by g to a smaller power. I can tell you more than that, I can tell you the order of the group generated by g to the k. That is, I can tell you how many things are in that, that subgroup, that particular subgroup, uh, and that's given by this formula. The order of g to the k is equal to n divided by, not by k, importantly, but by the greatest common divisor of n and k. Right? We have to make sure that what number we have right here actually divides n, so we take the greatest common divisor of n and k. Now a very useful corollary of this theorem is that we are going to have an element, g to the k is going to have the same order as the element g, if and only if this thing that we're dividing by is actually 1, which is to say that if g is an element of the larger group g and it has order n, then the element g to the k is also a generator for the group generated by little g uh, if and only if the integer k is relatively prime to the order of the element g. That is, if n and k are coprime. Now this is something that's very useful for us. This is, tells us uh, very quickly how to determine the number of generators of a cyclic group. Just as an example here, going back to the things we did in the previous slide, let's go back to z mod 12z. Uh, what was the, the first thing we need to do is identify a generator. In z mod 12z, we picked 1 to be our generator, and the order of 1 was 12, the size of the group. Then our goal, if we wanted to determine the order of any particular elements, would be to view these elements as powers of the generator. So for example, take 2 and view that as 1 squared. And as soon as we've done this, we can apply this theorem to say, all right, um, the order of 1 is 12, my integer k in this instance is 2, and the greatest common divisor of 12 and 2 is 2, and so the order of the element 2 inside z mod 12z is 6. Now similarly, uh, just an example where the integer we're looking at doesn't happen to divide the order of the group, if we're looking at something like 8, We'd view 8 as 1 raised to the 8th power inside z mod 12z. And in order to compute the order of 8, we would take 12, the order of 1, and divide it by the greatest common divisor of 8 and 12, which is 3. You could also go to our less intuitive example, which was u of 13. Uh, we saw that u of 13 was the group generated by 2. And so if we were interested in computing the order of the element, meant 5, what we could do is we could view 5 as a power of 2. Right? 5 belongs to this cyclic group, so it can be written as 2 to some power. In fact, we saw from our table that 5 could be written as 2 to the ninth power. And so to determine the order of the element 5, all we have to do is take 12 and divide it by the greatest common divisor of 9 and 12, which is 3. And we determine that the order of the element 5 is actually 4 
inside of the group view of 13. Now, as I said previously, we're very often, when we're given a cyclic group, asking ourselves how many generators this cyclic group has. We always know that it has one. Um, and in fact, it's, as we will see, almost certainly going to have more than one generator. Now, in order, by our previous theorem, if we want to determine the number of generators of a cyclic group, uh, what we really need to do is determine the order of that cyclic group and then count uh, the number of integers, number of positive integers less than the order of that group uh, that happen to be relatively prime to the order of the group. And this process is done so frequently within abstract algebra and number theory that the mathematician Euler uh, created his own notation to represent this quantity. He used phi of n to denote the number of integers k uh, in between 1 and n relatively prime to n. So this is called Euler's phi function, or sometimes Euler's phi function, phi and phi, just different pronunciations of this symbol here in Greek. Uh, I use both pronunciations, and there's no predicting which one I'm going to use when, uh, unfortunately. Um, and occasionally, not so much in abstract algebra, but in a number theory context, you're going to want to define a value for phi of 1, which doesn't necessarily make sense from the way we've defined it here, but by convention, we do define phi of 1 uh, to be 1. It follows that if you're looking at any old group in the world, and you take a group element little g, and it has order n, uh, that phi of n is the number of generators of the group generated by g. Additionally, the statement, if we start with the number n, and we look at the number of the set, the set of integers, k, uh, positive integers with in between 1 and n, that are relatively prime to n, we already have a name for the set of those numbers. That's the set u of n. Uh, phi of n would then turn out to be the size of this set, or the order of the group, um, if you want to speak in terms of abstract algebra. And what I've done here is I've just listed the first handful of numbers. So here I've got n in the first row of this table and phi of n in the second row of this table. And so you can see some nice things happening. By convention, phi of 1 is 1. Um, phi of 2 is 1 almost not quite vacuously. Uh, and then you can go on and you can just do some computations to check that these are all correct here. Uh, you might notice a handful of things. For instance, as soon as you get rid of 1 and 2, further than that in the table, everything you see is even. Um, that is something that can be proven. The phi of n is always an even function. It also has some really nice number theoretic uh, properties. It's called a multiplicative function, although that isn't exactly what you mean, what you might think it would mean, unless you're a number theorist. Um, None of that is, is super relevant for abstract algebra, it's just kind of interesting. Uh, and this is a very famous function, so I did want to introduce that notation for you. Now the last thing that we're going to do in this slide is I'd like to do one application of this theorem. Like I said, I'm not going to prove it, but let's see how we can put it to use and see if this can help us with one more observation that's going to come into play in the fundamental theorem of finite cyclic groups. So. Here's the application. Let's say we were interested in computing all elements of z mod 40 that happen to have order 10. Now, z mod 40 is a really nice, easy group to work with. We can pick out a generator without thinking. We can use 1, which is a very nice uh, choice of generator. And any old number n that belongs to z mod 40 can be thought of as 1 raised to the nth power. Again, a kind of weird notation. 1 raised to the nth power means 1 added to itself n times. Um, so that's what we mean by number n. Now, this number n will have order 10 if and only if uh, the greatest common divisor, if, if I take 40, the order of the element 1 inside of z mod 40, and if I divide it by the greatest common divisor of n and 40, if I get an answer of 10, then I'm going to have an order of 10. Now, this gives us an equation. We can clear denominators in this equation and then cancel out, you know, divide by 10 on both sides. And what results is that we will have a generator or an element of order 10 in z mod 40 uh, if and only if 4 is equal to the greatest common divisor of n and 40. 
If this is to be the case, it follows that n is going to be 4 times k, where k is an integer, but not just any integer, it's going to be an integer prime to 10. And we want this n, if this n lives in z mod 40, then it has to be less than 40. Um, so it follows that n is going to be equal to 4k, k must be prime to 10, and n has to be less than or equal to 40. Uh, now we need to know, in order to solve this problem, we need to know the number of positive integers, um, less than 10 and relatively prime to 10, so we have a name for that, that's phi of 10. D those are the different choices for k. And if we go through and we look at the numbers between 1 and 10, relatively prime to 10, we see that k has to belong to the set 1, 3, 7, and 9. Plugging that into our equation for n, right up here, it follows that n has to be one of the following four numbers, 4, 12, 28, or 36. And that's all we had to do in order to find all these elements. So the elements of z mod 40z of order 10 are 4, 12, 28, and 36. Now, something that you might notice is that if you looked at the smallest of these numbers is 4. If you looked at the group generated by 4 sitting inside z mod 40, um, you would get each of these numbers, 4, 12, 28, and 36. They're all multiples of 4. They all belong, that is, they all belong to the group generated by 4 in z mod 40z. So we started out just saying, let's find all elements of z mod 40 that happen to have order 10. We found one of them that had order 10, say 4, and we looked at the group generated by that, and we seem to have found all elements of order 10 inside z mod 40. There was nothing in a, there was nothing that we should have previously thought that would suggest that we could find every single element of z mod 40z of order 10 sitting inside the group generated by just one of them, and yet that happened to be the case here. All of the elements of z mod 40 of order 10 belong to the group generated by just one of them, and that's kind of an interesting phenomenon, and you'll find if you play around with cyclic groups enough and use your Excel tables or just run enough examples on your own, you'd start to notice trends like this. Um, going on, and you might start to wonder if something more is going on here with cyclic groups, and in fact there is, uh, which is what we'll be getting to sort of in the next set of slides.